Ja. Okay. Okay, thanks everyone for coming and uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Anik Mazumdar. I work for Cisco. Joined here by my colleagues um, Shishang from Nefos 6 and Sharmin also from Cisco. So, what are we going to talk about today? Uh, Ice House, right? Not very exciting. Not anymore. Uh, but we are not going to talk about here about roadmaps or what's coming up in Liberty or something beyond that. Those are other sessions people are covering already. We are just going to talk about, OK, so we have IPv6 and we have public cloud. So how does IPv6, what, what is the importance of IPv6 in the context of public cloud? And then how we took a small piece of work out of that and tried to productionize it. Okay. So what, what, how, how was the journey in, in, for productionization? So what, what things worked out of the box? What things didn't work? What, what were some of the things we took from Juno? What, what are the things we had to develop? And uh, how did we test it for a production claim scale deployment? That's basically what this thing is about. This is about sharing our experience. So that's why it's called a case study, right? It's not about roadmaps or anything like that. So. IPv6 in public cloud, so what's the relevance? So here, like, this is my first summit here. So when I hear people talking, there's a lot of talk about private cloud, there's a lot of talk about enterprise, but public cloud is a little different ball game, right? So you're, you're not in control of the workload, you do not know who the tenant can be or is, right? So anything, you, you, are, you should be ready to handle anything, and at a very large scale. And large scale, the problem with IPv4 is that the number, it's, it's not very large scale, with public IPs, it's limited. Everybody is feeling the crunch by now. Even the RFC 1918 private IPs, it's a limited pool. So the provider cannot literally afford to number every VM. That's why the concept of overlapping IPs and everybody has the same IPs. You have the NAT, you have all those problems, right? So IPv6 in public cloud takes all of those things away. You don't need that, and you don't have the problem of overlapping IP. But the problem is that adoption, right? So it's a chicken and egg problem. So you ask the provider, the cloud provider, do you have IPv6? And they say no. OK, then why do I need to worry about it? We'll work with IPv4 the way we have been working. So that's what one of the bullet points says, that one of the purpose of IPv6 in public cloud is to enable adoption, right? So if you, as a public cloud provider, if somebody does not proactively do it, tenants won't come, and, and tenants won't be using it and the problem will start getting worse and worse. And why it is actually important to have IPv6 in the public cloud, like with things like Internet of Everything and Internet of Things, right, IOE, IoT, it, it's talking about massive scale. Millions of endpoints you possibly cannot uh, address with V4 addresses, so you must have IPv6. Lots of telcos are at least numbering all of their underlay, that is their physical network with IPv6. Whenever you talk to the telcos and say that I want to host a public cloud in your environment, I mean, do, they partner with somebody like Cisco. They say, do you support IPv6? Because our infrastructure is purely IPv6 by now. We want OpenStack to also support IPv6. So that, these are some of the reasons, and I, I don't want to go like bullet by bullet, why public, in public cloud IPv6 is very, very important. Uh, this is a statistics. These bars do not show the adoption level of IPv6, but basically the thing to look at here is that these are some of the major public cloud providers today. And the adoption level for these are at various levels. Some support it in a shared public network. Of course, I may be missing something. And some support it at, say, a load balancer VIP level. So I only support like a V6 VIP, but I do not support the VMs to be addressed with IPv6 addresses. So they are at various kinds of adoption level, but in any case, it's, it's not very high level of adoption, right? So people are just starting to get there. As we go through Kilo and Liberty, the features are getting more matured, and the features were already there in ICE House are getting more stable, right? So as OpenStack is mature, people, we, we are also in a position to adopt it more and more. So what did we do? What did we do? What was our case study? It was about enabling IPv6 in a, in a ice house environment using Red Hat OpenStack for pure provider network. That was the simplest use case. 
Why? Because when you go for a provider network, you're not dealing with neutron router. If I go for tenant network, I have to understand how tenant networking works with IPv6. That is a feature that was available Juno onwards, so you have to first stabilize it, you have to mature it. So we, we wanted to see at the simplest level for a provider network where the router is external, I don't have to deal with a lot of open stack stuff. Is it easy enough? Is that a cakewalk, right? If that is, we'll go to the next step. But in that venture, we found out several things which my colleagues will also explain. So where we made the major changes, where we, not the changes I'll say, where, what were our touch points? That, that's actually, you see the red stars there, right? So many of the changes were at the network node level where we have to do several stuff. We did not change anything on the APIs, but we did put some validation code on when you say, suppose enter IPv6 default gateway. Uh, is it a valid default gateway? Is it something that can actually be used, right? So some of the validation stuff we introduced so that it's, uh, the, it can actually work. And also on the compete node side, security groups, IPv6. So we, just to make sure that Slack works, right? You can actually send, get an RA announcement from, from a provider router, things like that. So what, how did the logical uh, scope look like? So first of all, we, we used dual stack, why? because some of the OpenStack services still, still needs IPv4, for, for example, metadata, right? It cannot work without IPv4. And dual stack is also, is how most people actually still use IPv6 today. I mean, there are so many things still dependent on v4. So we use dual stack. We also use provider routers, because it is a provider, uh, provider network, so the router is external. It's a piece of actually two Nexus 9000 Cisco switches. Um, the RA, the router advertisement, was uh, done from those routers. Uh, one of the things you might note here is that the OBIT, the AM OBIT, the OBIT is one. That means we, we basically enable Slack for address assignment and address allocation, but we also use DHCPv6 stateless for optional information like DNS server. So that is, that is how our setup was. We use DNS mask for the DHCP v6 stateless option. It's not a separate process, just the same DNS mask, also handing out optional information like DNS server. Now we come to the next session, that what we, the challenges that we face, so. Thanks, Anik. Yep. So uh, we're going to, uh, in a subsequent session, uh, cover um, a lot of uh, security-related issues that we encounter, operational, functional gaps, uh, and what we did for scale testing um, over this period of implementation. So starting with one of the most interesting uh, security vulnerabilities that we identified was uh, with respect to reconnaissance attacks. So uh, if you understand, when um, Neutron creates a port, uh, it uh, also creates um, uh, a, a Linux bridge and, um, subs and also accompanying tap interfaces and uh, it plumbs the OVS uh, interfaces into this bridge. Now, by virtue of Slack, uh, IPv6 addresses get automatically configured on these devices, like the QBRs and the QVOs. Um, what subsequently happens is that when these interfaces uh, receive or auto-configure their IPv6 addresses, uh, a hacker from within his VM can scan uh, the, all the, of these interfaces on the, on the hypervisor that it resides on uh, by doing a mere ping six on the, on the FF02 colon colon one, which is the all nodes multicast address. And um, in response to that, all of these interfaces are going to expose their IPv6 configured interfaces uh, back to the hacker. So that's one sweep of scan that the hacker can do. Uh, as a result of this. Now, um, uh, there are several services that run on the compute host like SSH that are connected to IPv6 and uh, um, using the, with the right set of credentials, the hacker can um, gain SSH access into the uh, hypervisor through one of these auto-configured uh, link local addresses. Now, uh, the, the manner in which this vulnerability was addressed, and this is one manner in which it was addressed, uh, there may be several other options, but uh, the one that was uh, recommended uh, in terms of uh, plugging this hole was uh, to globally disable uh, IPv6 uh, interfaces 
for all current devices and anything that would get created in the future, like new virtual machines on that hypervisor. So disable IPv6 globally at the host level, and that would not auto-configure any interface once you know, a device would come up. Um, so so we, we implemented this vulnerability fix and verified that none of the QVB uh, or Linux bridges or QVO interfaces received an IPv6 and therefore nothing was pin pingable and there was no scannable uh, uh, operation you know, that could have been performed by um, a potential hacker. Now, uh, in doing so, uh, we also uh, uh, discovered a very fundamental bug in Neutron and we'll probably cover that in uh, one of the subsequent sessions. All right, thanks, Jeremy. Um, in the next slides, I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, heavily on the IPv6, IPv6 side. So Charmin uh, shared with you guys one of our major security concerns uh, we, dis we discovered during the, the uh, production or t testing. Um, but actually, in the IPv6 world, uh, there is uh, the notion of first-to-hop security protection which gives users uh, the list of tools you can use to, bu to build your first uh, line of defense on the router or on the switch, right, sitting on the edge. So for uh, some example, let's say the IPv6 RA guard, the DCP RA guard, and also the source guard, and destination guard, uh, prefix guard, and sure they also imply the device tracking. So follow the same best practice recommendations. We introduced the RA guard the first time into the ice house release. And actually, what we did is we tried to backport the, the, the code from the Juno and make it available and work in the ice house environment. So conceptually, it's very simple. Um, what we try to do here is we want to block. We, want to, we only want to allow the router advertisement from the legitimate address. In this case, it's the link local address of the default gateway of tenant network sitting on the upstream router. right? Um, so in, by doing so, the hacker cannot send any bogus RA to any VM instance in the network. And you may also questioning uh, how this link local, local address is actually feeding to the neutron router. Actually, as a matter of fact, the link local address of the tenant gateway is actually provided as a gateway parameter during the subnet creation process. So by the same token, we also introduced another uh, feature called the DCP v6 guard. This is a feature completely new to us house, also completely new to the community. Um, here, the DCP v6 guard tried to block those, uh, on, uh, tried to block the, the uh, DCP v6 information reply message from the unauthorized the DCP v6 server. So by, uh, in order to achieve this goal, the time when Neutron Server tried to create this dynamic security group uh, policy for any port, and as soon as, as soon as the Neutron Server realized, oh, this port is actually tied to uh, IPv6 subnet running in the DCP v6 stateless mode, and it is going to automatically add a one more rule to the port. And the port says, I will only allow the information reply coming from the link local address of the DNS mask binding interface inside a QDCP namespace, right? So in other words, if any hackers sitting in this OpenStack cluster and try to mimic or try to send out some uh, wrong information to poison your DNS uh, as a name server cache, then thus reply cannot go through. I should is there I also mentioned a couple other uh, security tools such as the destination uh, guard, but those are heavily rely on the on the edge router and switch, so we're not going to cover them here in this presentation. So just in case any audience here plan to use a Nexus 9K or any Nexus product um, with IPv6 enabled OpenStack cluster, I want to bring a couple of things to your attention. The first one is on the any layer two segment, please remember to turn off this, the uh, OMF, which is optimized multicast flood, because otherwise it's going to, all of the attempts try to do the uh, IPv6 neighbor discovery are going to fail. So please remember to turn it off. 
And in case you have a VPC in place, we also recommend you to, to use this command, IPv6 ND synchronize command, to accelerate the, IP, uh, the address table convergence between your VPC peers. On the layer three side, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, we also recommend you to turn on the HSP, uh, HSP, HSRP instance to provide redundance of your tenant gateway IP address. So next, I'm going to hand over back to Charmin. So um, some of the operational challenges when we tried to productionalize this, um, and, and we, there were several others, but these were one of the uh, major issues that uh, we had to uh, uh, resolve, fix, identify, or just record as an open item, as a caveat. So some of the first things that we did was uh, uh, image support testing. Um, Slack For Slack and DHCP v6 stateless, because that was the scope of our requirement. Uh, in terms of Slack, all the images passed fine. There was no issue uh, with uh, Slack as a function. Uh, as far as the Windows was, con was concerned, um, Slack and DHCP v6 stateless worked as is uh, for the 2008 and 2012 uh, images. Um, for the CentOS and the RHEL images, um, there is a, a bug in the, DHCP's, uh, in the DHC client uh, script wherein in the absence of the network manager, it would overwrite the IPv four or IPv6 DNS name servers in the resolve.com. So uh, we had to enable Network Manager to uh, address that issue. Uh, in case of Ubuntu, uh, in addition to having to enable the Network Manager, uh, there is still an outstanding issue in the glibc library where the resolver uh, imposes some sort of limitation on the number of DNS servers that can be added to the Etsy resolve. And, um, if you exceed that number, it's going to truncate the DNS servers in resolve.com. So that was one more thing that required to be noted. Uh, in terms of IPv6 system of record inconsistencies, now this was a very corner case, but nonetheless very prevalent. And this scenario occurs um, in a situation where uh, if there is um, a virtual machine on an IPv4 only network, uh, and it's at a, some subsequent point in time, you add an, uh, an IPv6 network uh, subnet to that network uh, by virtue of, again, Slack, when the VM receives an RA, it will auto-configure the uh, interfaces with IPv6, but, which is fine, which is expected behavior. But what happens in OpenStack is that there is no system of record for a co corresponding IPv6 interface in the Neutron database. And also, it would not, it, would, it, it, it is an out of band configuration, so there would be no IPv6 tables, rules that would get generated on the compute node for that particular VM. So that's something that is still an open item and a corner case that needs uh, uh, probably, it's, it's not something that's just a small patch by any measure, but needs to be discussed in the community. Now, uh, as far as IPv6 uh, gating criteria is concerned, if you recall from the previous slides, when we said that we addressed this uh, security, sorry, When we said that we were addressing the, the reconnaissance attack issue by globally disabling uh, IPv6 addresses uh, on the hypervisor, this actually manifested in another issue, uh, and that's a fundamental bug in, in the Neutron code base, wherein um, the, when we, we disabled it, so basically in theory, first of all, uh, disabling IPv6 globally on the hypervisor should not affect uh, VM traffic being forwarded to uh, or IPv6 traffic being forwarded to the to the guest VM. But what we saw is that when we di when we disable IPv6 on the host hypervisor, all of the IPv6 table rules got wiped out uh, for the guests uh, uh, against the tap interfaces. Uh, when we dug down deep into the code, we realized that uh, IP tables manager actually uses this very same flag uh, as a gating factor to decide whether or not to generate IP6 tables on the compute host or not. In, in, in reality, it has got no bearing, no connection, but that was an issue and, and a bug has already been submitted to the community at this point. Um, in terms of subnet validation between v4v6, we discovered this very recently, uh, and we happened to stumble this, upon this when we uh, enabled uh, a certain flag, which is force gateway on subnet, which really does IPv4 um, scheme type of validation. And um, it triggered a new bug in IPv6, wherein uh, IPv6 uh, subnet validation went through the same routine. And you're not, I mean, it, it does not bode well because IPv4 schemes are different from IPv6. So you would, all, it, it resulted in this uh, uh, invalidating a valid subnet creation scenario. So 
that's a fix that still open needs to be put in the community. Uh, from a host compute perspective, um, this is not related to IPv6, but something that we realized when we did our scale testing is that um, beyond a certain load, uh, we started seeing inconsistencies in the TAP interfaces. So TAP interfaces in the compute hosts would intermittently go down for no apparent reason and blocking traffic. Uh, what we realized was that uh, the network manager on the host uh, was actually interfering with the, uh, or trying to manage the devices, uh, the TAP devices that it didn't even create, but it was trying to manage those TAP devices and putting them down for, uh, for no apparent reason. So we had to disable network manager on the, on the compute hosts. So this is, this is just some of the high level flavors of the issues that we encountered and uh, mitigated along the way. Uh, coming to scale testing, performance testing. Um, so our f requirements and, um, were very focused. Uh, we had very specific uh, use cases to deal with. So our objectives were primarily um, 4,000 interface test bed for IPv4 and IPv6 uh, each. Uh, generate ICMP traffic between or against these, uh, uh, these interfaces for V4 and V6. Uh, test the resiliency of DHCP agents and metadata agents because those were the focus of components for enabling this feature. And uh, ensure that the stability of the test bed over a period of time was maintained. So we left the test bed running for a few days and then again ran the ping test to ensure nothing went down, things like that. So uh, from a process and tool perspective, we developed an in-house uh, Python package uh, that uh, generated concurrent requests uh, against all of these actions to boot VMs, to reboot to uh, ping, gather stats, to do some preliminary analytics, not very fancy, but something that would get us going with our outputs and numbers, C capture console logs to make sure metadata behaved the way it was supposed to, customize VMs, things like that. From a scenario perspective, we executed uh, three to four scenarios. Uh, first scenario being 2,000 uh, dual stack, dual VNIC VMs. So dual stack, dual VM, just to accommodate the 4,000 interface scenario. Uh, at any given point in time, we generate a load of 50 concurrent uh, boots or reboots. And this was generated from another blade, that's a 40 vCPU blade, so we ensured we had full concurrency uh, when we tried to generate this load. Um, so in, in, in a, in a to total of 8,000 interfaces across three um, networks, uh, you know, performing all sorts of operations like DHCP offers, acts, uh, requests, replies, uh, et cetera. From a scale testing topology, um, our control plane uh, had about 35 virtual machines. Um, just basically the control plane for OpenStack doing um, Keystone, Cinder, Glance, API, uh, the MySQL Galera cluster, uh, RabbitMQ clusters. Uh, from a data plane perspective, we had 18 compute nodes um, and uh, with uh, two by 10 um, physical cores uh, with an oversubscription CPU, uh, oversubscription ratio of four times CPU and one and a half times RAM. So that gave us about 160 VMs per node to, to be hosted. Um, we had DHCP agents running on uh, four network nodes, but, but at, at any given point in time, we had two DHCP agents serving each network. And we, and we had in a total of three networks. So all these VMs are distributed across three uh, networks uh, for IPv6 and uh, IPv4. Uh, in terms of storage, we used a shared um, Ceph cluster, and the target test VM itself was uh, a very, uh, very minimal flavor with a single uh, CPU, um, a sing uh, one gig uh, RAM uh, image uh, uh, flavor. Sorry, uh, it, the image used was Cirrus, and uh, it was a, a dual NIC uh, VM again to just to simulate the 4,000 interfaces. Uh, so you can see from the scale testing perspective, once the test bed was up, we had an even distribution of all VMs across all the compute nodes. And uh, just some raw statistics, uh, for the most part, the VM boot times um, were reflective of a range of about, performance range of about uh, 20 to 60 milliseconds, uh, sorry, seconds, and going all the way sometimes up to uh, three minutes. At, at the tail, tail end of the uh, scale testing, we had some uh, control plane level errors, but we did meet our basic uh, uh, test criteria and requirements from a scale perspective. I'm going to hand it back to Shishong for some performance analysis. Sure, thank you, Charmin. Uh, Charmin actually shared with you, Shami, uh, actually shared with you the, the scalability environment. And now I want to switch gear a little bit and talk about IPv6 performance in this scale environment. Uh, as you may recall in the VM distribution chart, you can see roughly around um, about 100 VM instance on each compute node, right? 
Um, and uh, let's first, as a, as a first step, let's take a look at how ping, how ping performs uh, on, on that VMs with about 100 VMs. Uh, on that, sorry, on that computers with 100 VMs. So in order to collect this result, uh, we design a test. We, do, we issue 100 ping to a VM at both IPv4 and IPv6 address simultaneously. And then we repeat the, uh, the same procedure across all of, all of those 100 VMs on the same compute nodes. So but that means we can have a larger volume of, of samples we can use to calculate the minimum, maximum, and also the average value of the ping. And, and here on this chart, you, can, you may also notice that I intentionally build this correlation so as a comparison between IPv4 and the IPv6 side by side so you can take a look. And I will walk through all of those charts with you uh, in the next couple of slides. So now let's first focus on those charts at the top. Uh, you can see that for the IPv4, the minimum response time range from, let's say, uh, 0 0.2 milliseconds to 0 0.2. 26 milliseconds. But if you move your focus to the right hand side, the maximum response time actually somewhere between 2.5 milliseconds or 5 milliseconds. And sure, in this case, you can see some outliers, right? And with average and dense around uh, 0 0.45 milliseconds. So this is how IPv4 ping perform in this scaled environment. Now, if you look at the charts at the bottom, which captures the IPv6 ping, also the minimum, maximum, and the average. And at this time, you can see the extreme similarity, right? And uh, as the next test, what we try to do is let's move up the protocol stack a little bit, uh, because ping only reach certain level in the ISO 7 model. So now in this case, we, we did the more tests and try to understand IPv6 performance and for TCP traffic and also the UDP traffic. And remember those one VMs we talk about, they're all running on the same compute node. And here we add two more. One act as an iperf, iperf server, another one act as an iperf client. And for each traffic run, I leave iperf running for uh, 200 seconds. And so the iperf can pump the traffic from the client towards the server direction. And since we talk about the iperf, I, I want to highlight two things um, because this is a pretty complicated testing. And in this presentation, uh, the data we collected only represent one single stream. So for, in other words, for TCP, you only see the throughput for one TCP stream, and so is for the UDP. Another thing is, uh, in order to avoid any further confusion, we use all of those default settings. For example, we use the default MS uh, settings for the TCP, and we also use the default setting for the UDP in terms of payload size. So we did not change anything. So now com coming back to this chart, you can see actually TCP performed pretty well in this case. Um, for the IPv4, TCP actually hit, hit up to the 13.1 gigabit per, sec per second. And if you look at the IPv6 data, it's, it's running in the, in, around in the same ballpark. Uh, it's a 12.7 gigabit per second. A little bit slower, uh, primarily because the IPv6 header is larger. It's 40 bytes versus 20 bytes, right? The 20 bytes is for the IPv4 header. Uh, but in summary, it's still pr pretty close. But if you look at the UDP, uh, remember, in this case, we still talk about one UDP string with the default MTU size set to 1,500. Uh, now, the UDP for IPv4, on average, the throughput go to 648 meg. But for IPv6, uh, the average UDP throughput stay at 603 meg per second. So it does not necessarily mean UDP perform worse than, than TCP. Uh, if you have a uh, jumble frame or if you have a parallel stream uh, taking place at the same time, then you can see UDP very easily hit up like a gigabit, uh, gigabit per second. Now in the second scenario, we did our testing slightly different. In this case, we, have a, we still have a 2VM, but in this case, 2VM spread across two compute nodes. 
Um, and in this case, what the implication is, traffic not only traverse the open virtual switch, the local open, switch, uh, open virtual switch, not only the BRNT, but also the BREX, right? At the same time, the traffic also go through the physical interface with the 10 gig capacity. Because of this physical uh, limitation on the pipeline uh, we can offer, so very naturally you can see that TCP actually, the throughput stay roughly around uh, 8.57 gigabit, uh, gigabit, uh, gigabits, which is still pretty good, right? That means you have 85% of your, uh, of your uh, pipelines. Uh, looking at the IPv6, in this case, is very, very close. Um, it's 8.29 gigabit per second between these two VMs instance across two different compute nodes. Um, but for UDP, it's very interesting. Actually, the data actually got smoothed out quite a while. Uh, here you can also see it's almo almost like a straight line already. For the IPv4, UDP throughput on average is around 680, uh, sorry, 690 meg. And for IPv6 UDP throughput, on average, it stay at 682 megabits per second. So here, um, in summary, I don't want to put too much comparison between the, the TCP versus UDP. Instead, I encourage you to look at these charts from the perspective that IPv4 and the IPv6. Because the point I want to make here is, in case any of any of our friends here plan to launch IPv6 in your cloud or in your uh, tra traditional net network, uh, I know based on our previous discussion with our customer, they always have a doubt in their, in their mind how well IPv6 performs versus IPv4. So I hope this uh, test result I share with you uh, across all of these charts is going to help you make your decision. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, that's a very, actually a very good point. Uh, sorry about for the confusion. Uh, in this case, like I mentioned, for every traffic run, I leave IP for 200 seconds, right? And every two seconds, I print out the statistics, which show you the, the throughput in real time. So what that means is by the end of the testing cycle, I have a 100 samples for that particular testing period of time, right? So, and this is the data I'm sharing with you on this diagram. All right. So now, uh, I know Charming um, and Anik, they both of them share with you a lot of challenge and issues we encountered during this uh, testing. And you may also one, be wondering right now what kind of change we made to the Icehouse release. So on this slide, I try to summarize a couple of things we believe we added value to, not only to this production system, but also we were going to add value to the community. So coming to the future, um, because this is Ice House, um, officially in the community, Ice House does not support IPv6, right? However, that does not necessarily mean as a user or as a cloud provider, you do not have a luxury to enjoy the benefit of IPv6. So as a matter of fact, we patched the Ice House, uh, the source code. Uh, there's a couple of main changes here. I share with you two of them. And on the controller side, we add a lot of checkpoints to make sure the incoming API call has the right format. For example, as Nick just mentioned, the, uh, the IPv6 gateway IP address must be in the link local address. Uh, in addition, we also uh, optimized, optimized the security group uh, policy source code in order to support the new features like DCP v6 guard. And, uh, on the network node, we actually fixed a lot of bugs. And here I share with you three of them. Uh, in the first case, in the first case, at the time when we evaluate the DCP.py file, uh, one thing we notice is they actually treated the DCP stateful mode in the exact same way as the DCP v6 status mode. Um, however, that's not the case. Uh, there's a very subtle difference between the stateful mode versus stateless mode. 
uh, if you think about from the neutron uh, subnet creation perspective, it is quite likely that in case you, if you want to use the DCV6 stateful mode, you're going to have allocation pool, or maybe more than one allocation pool. But on the other side, the, slate, the DCPv6 stateless mode doesn't really care because all it offers is the optional information, such as name, name servers. So for these reasons, we actually restructured the, the spawn, uh, uh, spawn process, that, can, uh, that particular method, in the way that we can differentiate these two scenarios, DCPv6 stateful mode versus DCPv6 stateless mode. In the second example I, I share with you here is a, a very, it's also very interesting because by, def, by the design, by the design when you use IPv6 subnet and that subnet running in the slack mode, you should not launch the DNS mask process. However, for the configuration, for the net neutron network configuration with only one IPv6 subnet, the code actually has a bug, and this bug leads to the, the case that it says try to launch a DNS mask process, but without any uh, the, the DCP range. In other words, it's completely useless. So over the time, you start noticing so how come you have a quite a few state process that are running, uh, running in the, uh, in the network node, and then you notice this is a bug. Actually, it's not quite obvious if you use the two stack mode. The last one, um, in, at least in the, in the uh, Ice House code or in, in the junior code, is still try to insert the default route to IPv6 subnet in the format of 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, .0, 0, but that's not the case, right? Uh, IPv6 does not like that format. Um, so while we're trying to fix all, those, all of these bugs, um, we're start, we start thinking how come these issues did not get captured in the unit test code. So we uh, look at the unit test uh, more carefully. And then we realize even in the, up to the Juno release, even the Juno release, the DNS mask process launch for IPv6 subnet is skipped. There's no unit test code for that. And for security group and IPv6 table, it's also skipped. Uh, so that's probably can explain some of the bugs I, I share with you why it kind of you know, go to the, the, the upstream uh, community. And so this gives us uh, the feeling that uh, is quite urgent, um, it has a quite urgent need for us to work on the testing side. Um, and uh, the result, we're working very active with the uh, Cisco QE team. Uh, we developed, uh, we not only bridged the gap, as I highlight here, uh, as part of the unit test section, but also developed uh, 22 more Tempest test cases. Uh, coverage functional test, API test, and also negative test. Uh, at the same time, uh, we also developed uh, quite a few variety test cases for the purpose of scalability and uh, performance testing. Uh, in case you are very, in case you're interesting, interested in uh, what we did, and don't worry about it because we are going to contribute back all of our code to the community. Now uh, let me hand uh, the floor back to Anik. So I think one of the key takeaways is that um, in OpenStack, right, when a feature comes out, there's a lot of difference between something being functional and something being production ready, right? We, did, we went through all this pain because we had a real customer demand behind it, right? We wanted to have a scalable network, scalable infrastructure with IPv6, which does not go down, or all these things do not come up when the customer is actually running there, right? Um, IPv6, one of the general attitude is that, okay, we have a problem with IPv6, let's try to do this and that and solve the problem. It's not a problem, it's trying to solve a problem, right? So, that, so it's very important that operators who are actually trying to do a CDS deployment come back and give this feedback back to the community, right? Otherwise, it always remains a functional code and everyone has to troubleshoot on their own and reinvent the wheel multiple times, right? I mean, everybody who will try to do something, something like that will have to go through the same pain, but just by sharing something like this, we save the trouble. Um, so what are the next steps? Next steps in, what, what does next steps mean? That once, since we are, done, gone, we are done with the provider network scenario, 
what are the other things that we need to do in order to have a functional public cloud with IPv6, right? One of the major things is tenant networking. Now, tenant networking code is there in Juno and Kilo, but one of the un unsolved problem is that how do you provide external connectivity? I mean, we were in an IPv6 session even yesterday. I mean, prefix delegation and other thing, ideas are being floated. It's the right thought process, but the code is, code is still not there. So without that sort of a thing, I mean, you, today in uh, V4 world, everyone brings their own address. That doesn't work with V6, because if you bring your own address, I need to NAT it in order to route it to the internet. I cannot NAT because it is IPv6. Nobody wants to support NAT in IPv6. But if I have to route your address out to the internet, I cannot do that because my ISP won't accept that. So it's a chicken and egg problem. So this is a very critical problem to be solved in a public cloud scenario. Why it is not so critical in private cloud? Because private cloud, you can also always put something else after the OpenStack cloud, right? And do something there. We have to be absolutely compliant with uh, the standards. Um, we also want to give the tenants the choice to do IPv6 only, v4 only, or dual stack. Today we only support dual stack, right? One of the bugs that Shishang, or I think Sharmin, you mentioned, is that uh, if you bring up a v4, if you add a v4 subnet after you have actually spun up a v6 subnet on a network, um, it gets a v6 address. Um, sorry, the other way around. It gets a v6 address without uh, having any entry in the neutron database. Now it's a behavior question also, right? It's a philosophical debate also. Uh, should the tenant have a choice to give an IPv6 address to a new VM or not? So such things need to be looked after. Multiple prefixes is very important because one of the things that IPv6 preaches that you really do not know, need the IP and port concept to represent application. You can as well have multiple v6 addresses, each representing an application because there are so many of those. So why do you need two constructs to represent a single, single thing? So we want to also support uh, multiple IPv6 prefixes which is, I believe, is there in Kilo already. Um, one other thing we want to support is something like Amazon, like Direct, Direct Connect, which allows a tenant to basically connect to their enterprise network over a private connection and not only to the internet. So that's about it. Uh, Share your experience. Hope it was useful. Thank you.